Good afternoon. Welcome to the IPA Power Hour webinar, The Work Ahead, Staffing the Clean Energy Economy. My name is Brian Hepner, Communications Manager for the Illinois Power Agency and host of today's presentation. To go over some housekeeping items, um, in order to reduce background noise, um, participants should keep themselves muted throughout the presentation. We'll be taking qu uh, questions from our audience toward the end, so please feel free to submit any questions you have um, during the webinar using the chat feature at the bottom of your Zoom window. Today's session is being recorded and will be available on the IPA website under About Us, About IPA slash events. A couple of points I want to emphasize. Um, this webinar is for general education purposes only and does not represent a legal interpretation of sta or statement of policy by the IPA or its staff. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our esteemed speakers for this session. Our first speaker is Joseph Kane. Joseph is a fellow at the Brookings Institution whose work focuses on infrastructure, examining challenges and opportunities facing the country's infrastructure workforce and its essential workforce more broadly, including workers in water and energy. Joseph has also testified to Congress on these issues in a hearing titled Skill, Upskill, and Reskill, Analyzing New Investments in Workforce Development. Prior to Brookings, Joseph was an economist for the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Our next speaker is Tanvi Shah, Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer for the Illinois Power Agency. Tanvi joined the IPA in 2023. In this role, she is responsible for developing strategies to increase access to Illinois' clean energy economy for historically excluded communities, building relationships and partnerships with key external stakeholders to advance diversity in the clean energy space. Prior to joining the IPA, Tanvi was the Director of Capacity Building at the Chicago Jobs Council. Our third speaker for this session is Hilary Scott Ogunrende, who is Deputy Director of Energy and Utility for the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. Hillary is a clean tech leader and an experienced professional in business and organizational development, operations management, and grant administration. She is a vocal and productive community advocate for the growth and economic equality of small and minority owned businesses. Our last speaker for the session is Hugo Avila, co-director for Central States SARE. He oversees various programs such as the Future Energy Jobs Act grant from DCEO to provide solar photovoltaic installer training in partnership with the St. Augustine College Institute of Workforce Development. Hugo has over 11 years of experience in workforce development programs with SARE, explicitly working with Chicagoland low-income and underserved communities. A brief overview on the IPA Power Hour and its scope. Power Hour is a, is a series of educational and informative webinars on a wide range of clean energy topics and emerging issues. Today's webinar will examine the role of workforce development and look at challenges and opportunities for ensuring a smooth transition. Here you'll see info on the Power Hour webinar taking place in October. Please visit the IPA website and click on this link to register. A quick overview on the agency and its responsibilities. Created in 2007, the IPA is responsible for the development of procurement plans and solar incentive programs in support of the Illinois Renewable Portfolio Standard. That concludes my introduction. Now I would like to welcome our first speaker, Joseph Kane. Joseph. Thanks, Brian, and thanks to, to IPA for um, for having me. Really, really excited to to be here. Um, I guess if you can advance to the to the next slide, or there we go, <laughs> uh, and you can go to go to the next one too. Um, so I, I'm just going to spend the next uh, few minutes talking about a report um, that my colleagues and I led at Brookings a, a few years ago on um, the clean energy economy, but very specifically. Um, how uh, inclusion and and really stronger career pathways can emerge um, in this space. You know, our goal wasn't precisely to quantify how many um, clean energy jobs are found across the country, uh, or to come up with a very uh, precise uh, or even duplicative definition of what green jobs are. 
but to better understand, you know, kind of what are individual workers, individual employers facing, um, and actually finding talent um, for for these um, these issues. And and I think you know, as you can see on this this first slide, um, you know, the reality is that there is a transition already happening in terms of the need um, for talent in this space. I mean, our our environment, our built environment continues to face uh, more chronic and acute stresses, um, climate pressures, whether it's uh, wildfire risk, floods, drought, uh, you know, the needs are, are pretty apparent across the country. Next slide. At the same time, um, you know, when we think of the transition to a clean energy economy, I mean, there, there's obviously, you know, deployment of, of new um, technologies, new designs, new types of projects are emerging across the country. Uh, the reality that that many buildings as well uh, are being upgraded or retrofitted to become more energy efficient. Um, and, and then, you know, various market forces as well, including greater, um, not just greater public funding, um, particularly from the federal government, but also uh, private appetite to invest in, in clean energy technologies is, is also widespread. Um, next slide. So, you know, the point is there is an ongoing transition here through a combination of market forces, consumer demand, um, as well as federal, state, and local policy to support that transition. Um, next slide. I think what's also obvious, and if you can keep clicking here, sorry, there's a lot of images on this one slide. Um, the There are a lot of different reports that have come out um, to better measure um, the scale and reach of our workforce concerns um, in this space, you know, whether it's the direct jobs involved here, the indirect jobs, the induced jobs, um, the reality that that the country is is already seeing and is projected to see um, continued job growth in in industries and occupations that that have an emphasis on these sorts of activities. Um, Again, our report is intended to be complementary, <laughs> uh, a value add, hopefully, to, to some of these other um, resources. And you know, most notably, the U.S. Energy and Employment Report comes out, um, you know, from from DOE and and other uh, other sources. To say nothing of other academic sources out there. So I highly highly encourage you all, if if you haven't, to to look at these sources as well. Um, next slide. So you know, just to get kind of a, at least a consistent definition out of the way first. Um, how do we define actually the clean economy and specifically clean economy jobs? Um, there are three, three considerations here. Um, one being that these jobs are involved directly in the production, transmission, and distribution of clean energy. Uh, two, you know, they impact end use um, energy consumption, particularly through the manufacturing of products, construction of, of buildings, um, and provision of services that, that promote energy efficiency. And then three, you know, help manage the environment um, and conserve and regulate natural resources. These uh, definitions were vital to us to actually flag what types of industries and, and what types of occupations are, are central to carrying out these activities. Um, next slide. So I'm gonna run through four chief findings from our report. And again, you can find this um, online if, if you simply Google, it's all public and free of charge. If you Google uh, inclusive clean economy Brookings and, and you'll find a full PDF that provides a lot more detail, but I'm gonna just provide some top level um, findings that came out of the report. First of these is, is just the reality that a wide range of industries and occupations are implicated in the transition to a clean energy economy. Um, next slide. And again, kind of reflective of, of those definitions from earlier, um, the way in which my colleagues and I kind of organized this, this data and information was really in, in three sort of subsectors, if you will. The first being a focus on energy generation um, or production. So think, you know, actual uh, power plant operators, for example, and, and other sort of engineering and technician positions involved in, in that process. Um, energy efficiency. Think of, again, the idea that many of our buildings, many uh, other parts of our built environment are going to have to be upgraded and adapted to these changes. Uh, so we tend to see a lot of construction and other sorts of uh, uh, skilled trades positions represented there. Um, third, uh, and finally, and certainly not least, um, is this category on envi environmental management and regulation. So you think of the role of various um, public entities and, and government entities that have to actually oversee um, all of these activities, you know, uh, are also hugely important um, to, to this economy. Um, next slide. 
And so when we actually look at all of these, these different um, subsectors, and, and you can look at our methodology online as well, I won't go through all of that right now, but, but we find that there are more than 320 um, occupations flagged across each of these. You can see kind of some of the associated employment totals for those, but you know, clean energy production, energy efficiency, environmental management all have big roles to play in this transition. And, and obviously, there are multiple branching career pathways here as well. And in as much as, yes, you know, wind turbine technicians and solar installers, and, you know, there are some fast growing occupations that tend to, to gravitate a lot of attention, particularly from researchers and, and policymakers. The reality is that there's a broad suite of, of pathways available to prospective workers and then also current workers. Um, next slide. Second finding is, well, you know, there are a variety of positions at play here in the in the clean energy economy. Though the reality also too is that many of, of these workers tend to earn higher and, and more equitable um, wages. Uh, next slide. So if we look at this, and I, you know, this chart is a little busy, but effectively this shows at you know for different percentiles of wages. So you know, if you look to the left of this chart, at, you know, the 10th or 25th percentile. Think of, of workers who are just starting their careers, you know, tend to earn, you know, lower incomes generally compared to those at the, the 75th or 90th percentile, uh, which tend to be more managerial and, you know, more advanced uh, positions in this economy. Uh, we tend to see higher wages, um, particularly at that lower end uh, of the wage distribution. So in other words, for workers who are just starting their careers with those who may not have a lot of experience, um, we tend to see wage premiums of up to 30% in some cases for different occupations. And now, you know, obviously this is an aggregation of, <laughs> of many different occupations and industries here. So, you know, some pay a little more, some pay a little less, but on average, we tend to see uh, at these lower percentiles, um, you know, more equitable wages. There, there are a variety of reasons for this, including industry norms, uh, certainly, uh, you know, influence of uh, unionization, uh, has a role to play too, but but also the value of the work. Um, you know, some skilled trades positions tend to pay higher relative to all jobs nationally. So you know, you think of some workers who might be in retail or or other service activities. They're just not earning as, as much as we tend to see in this in this slice of the clean energy economy. Um, next slide. Third finding, you know, while wages are more competitive, um, there are fewer um, formal educational barriers to entry in many of these occupations. Um, next slide. So again, if we look at this on, on a chart, you know, and we kind of divide it up in each of these subsectors, the three subsectors, you look at clean energy production, energy efficiency, and environmental management, you tend to see, you know, huge um, shares of, of workers that only have a high school diploma or less um, in, in many cases, particularly in clean energy production and energy efficiency. And that environmental management um, category, you know, which again, tends to involve some of those government um, positions and other regulatory positions, we then tend to see slightly higher um, formal educational barriers to entry, typically a requirement at least for a four-year college degree, if, if not a more advanced degree. But, but across the board, when we, we aggregate you know, the trends we see across all of these hundreds of occupations, we tend to see uh, less reliance on, on formal, um, at least higher levels of formal education. Um, next slide. Instead, you know, and, and this is going to point to some of the implications here in a, in a, in a bit, but in 10, we send, tend to see a, a reliance on on-the-job training. Um, you know, work-based learning opportunities have, have a huge role to play in actually connecting prospective workers, including younger workers and, and students, to positions in this space, um, and also current workers to grow their careers. So, you know, just as one quick statistical example, you know, only about 17% of clean energy production and energy efficiency workers have a bachelor's degree or higher, yet 75% of those workers require some level of on-the-job training. Um, so, you know, uh, apprenticeships, internships, uh, pre-apprenticeships, you know, variety of different ways in which they can get that experience, but puts a lot of onus on employers um, in particular to, to provide those opportunities. Um, next slide. And last finding, I'm going to focus more on kind of, well, who are these workers? You know, what does their demographic profile um, look like? And, and generally, we, we tend to see a lack of diversity uh, in terms of uh, gender, race, and age in, in many of these positions. Um, next slide. I'll just point to a couple here. And again, you can find more, more details in the full report. But 
Um, women in particular are, are tremendously, you know, underrepresented in, in many of these positions. You can see here across each of these three subsectors, um, you know, compared to the national average, which is around about 50% or so for all occupations across the country, you know, we're, we're talking under 20% <laughs> in, in some cases. And there are some individual occupations, actually, you know, solar installers, for example, only has about seven and a half percent are, are women. Um, so, you know, huge uh, barriers, I think, <laughs> that that um, more and different types of people have to face um, both to enter, but also grow their careers in this space. And we tend to see this particularly in the lack of, of gender um, diversity. Next slide. In terms of, of race, um, we also tend to see um, underrepresentation among certain racial groups. Um, you know, this includes also um, Black workers, uh, Asian workers, um, Hispanic workers. What I'll point to, though, with, with uh, an interesting point to, to note here is that among Hispanic workers towards the right side of this chart, you'll actually see overrepresentation uh, of Hispanic workers in clean energy production and energy efficiency relative to, to sort of their representation across the entire economy. And the primary reason for that is they tend to be um, very concentrated in construction um, positions. And so in as much as there is representation in some of those positions, we tend to see underrepresentation, particularly in managerial roles and engineering roles. So, you know, we have to think of, of, of these numbers in terms of not just the whole economy, uh, the clean energy economy, that is, as a whole, but we do need to think of them in terms of specific occupations and whether these workers are actually moving up the career ladder in, in their careers. Um, next slide. So just a few few implications here before um, passing it off to, to the next speaker. But you know, I, I think it's you know few takeaways right that that, that I think are, are notable from from our analysis and and are backed up by by other um, research that that has come out as well and, and more recently. But you know, many of these occupations tend to pay you know competitive and and higher wages. Um, you know, formal educational barriers can be lower um, for for these positions, with with the huge caveat that that we need on the job <laughs> um, training for for many of these individuals. And and something that I didn't touch on as much, but the report goes into a little more detail, is the actual skills. You know, when we think of green skills and and sort of the skills and and knowledge that these workers are going to need. You know, they they tend to acquire a lot of uh, familiarity uh, and acumen in science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM fields and other technical disciplines. And, and so that provides greater transferability that even if they don't stay in this space forever um, or change jobs over time, these workers are still gaining um, a combination of hard and soft skills that tend to be in demand um, and quite valuable in the labor market. Um, next slide. And you know, in terms of the obstacles here, again, you know, when we think of, of, of many of the, the demographic uh, you know, categories, you know, uh, we tend to see tremendous underrepresentation of women here. Uh, we tend to see an imbalance in, in, in gender, uh, both gender and racial diversity. And, and I didn't include a chart here, but um, you can find it in the, in the report, you know, the age of these workers tends to be also quite, quite high um, as, as well, at least relative to the national median. Um, you know, some workers are often well into their 50s, they may be eligible for retirement, you know, across the whole um, skilled trades space and the infrastructure space, so this includes transportation and water as well, um, we tend to see a silver tsunami um, hitting in, in many of these fields. And so, you know, there's a huge need for knowledge transfer, mentorships, um, to actually hopefully embrace younger talent as they move into these positions as well. Um, next slide. So just a last couple of slides here, I think, you know, sort of the elephant in the room, you know, with all of this, of course, and, and me being in, in DC at the moment, is, is just the influx of federal funding, you know, for both, um, you know, not just clean energy and sort of, you know, climate upgrades, but, but also for workforce um, development issues. A lot of individuals don't really think, well, there isn't much workforce development funding within the bipartisan infrastructure law or the Inflation Reduction Act, most notably. Uh, but there actually is. I mean, there is a lot of flexibility and eligibility um, for employers and other eligible entities to actually use this funding for training, for recruitment, um, for hiring purposes. Um, my colleagues and I are going to be coming out with a report in another couple of weeks um, that is going to be specifically identifying which programs within those bills or those laws um, include eligibility for green workforce development. So happy to share that um, when, when that comes out. Um, next slide. 
And I think this is just a final slide to point to here, um, as I'd be remiss of being a Brookings researcher, not to point you to a, a bunch of other reports that are out there um, on, on similar issues. And so in as much as what I profiled here on sort of clean energy jobs, you, you can find that report online. Um, I've also led a lot of work on water workforce issues. Um, so, you know, those utilities certainly share many similar um, concerns. You can, can look at that report as well. And then more recently have done more of a catch-all report of all infrastructure workers. So not just uh, in the energy space, but in the water, transportation, and broadband uh, space as well, where there are some pretty significant commonalities. And so this is going to be a lot of work coming out also in the in the upcoming months and, and really look forward to continuing the conversation on all of that. So that's all I got. So um, thank you so much for, for having me. Thank you, Joseph Kane. Up next, we have Tanvi Shah of the Illinois Power Agency. Thank you, Brian and Joseph. Um, so I'll just uh, give a quick alert that I am having some technical issues, so my camera will be off and I won't be able to join you visually. But what I'm gonna do is walk through a few of the state's um, policies that are designed to advance equity and inclusion in the clean energy economy. So I'd like to begin on the next slide um, by sharing the IPA's diversity, equity, and inclusion goals to underscore that strengthening and advancing equity in the clean energy economy is core to the IPA's mission and our work. Um, to that end, on the next slide, you'll see that um, a vast growing sort of area of our work is the implementation of the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act's equity and diversity requirements for all of our um, IPA administered incentive programs and procurements. And so these new CJA provisions include um, the equity accountability system, which has a couple of different components. It has the minimum equity standard, the EEC category of our Illinois Shines slash adjustable block program, as well as the prioritization of bids and competitive procurements. And so all of these elements ensure that across the scope of our programs and procurements, that entities that are participating are really focusing on the use of contractors and individuals that will increase the diversity of this industry. And the goal of the system um, is really to advance equity by providing access to the clean energy economy for businesses and workers, specifically from communities that have been excluded from these economic opportunities and also have been subject to disproportionate levels of pollution or disproportionate um, public health outcomes. So another element of the system is the racial disparity study that we'll be conducting next year. And this is a broad study of the entire clean energy sector in Illinois. And it's to measure the presence and impact of discrimination of minority businesses and workers. We'll be assessing the state's renewable energy sector for access, participation, and utilization of contractors, and specifically focusing on minority owned and disadvantaged workers. And then um, based on what we find, we're authorized to adjust the equity accountability system requirements to then better meet the policy objectives that are stated in CJA. Another element um, of CJA that the IPA is required to do is to incorporate equity um, in its data collection and, account and to ensure accountability and transparency. And so we will be um, trying to collect and share more data about what's going on in the clean energy economy. And we're required to collect information um, on demographic and geographic attributes of um, project workforce for all of our programs and utility scale projects, and then report on that data annually in order to track how we're doing and see whether the system is successful or not. And then another component is also um, conducting outreach to small and disadvantaged businesses. And this is happening across the state where we're trying to in actively engage businesses and communities to connect and promote these initiatives. Our goal here is to build coalitions with these organizations to help increase participation in the clean energy sector. And then the last component of this is the um, energy workforce equity portal. And um, the IPA has created this online portal that will provide information on the equitable workforce transition for clean energy companies, as well as individuals who are looking to join the sector and the public at large. And so I'd like to dive into a couple of these elements um, of the CJA equity requirements in greater detail. So first, I'll start with the minimum equity standard. On the next slide, you'll see. 
that this is, um, as I mentioned, a central component of the equity accountability system, and it helps ensure that the growing clean energy economy is accessible by everyone. And so under the MES, an increasing portion of the workforce of an entity that's participating in the IPA's programs or procurements have to meet baseline equity requirements. Specifically, the MES is a minimum percentage of the project workforce that has to consist of equity eligible persons. And so these are individuals that would benefit most from equitable uh, investments by the state that are designed to combat discrimination. And so currently that level is set for 10% for this program year, but eventually will increase to 30% in 2023 or 2030, uh, sorry. And then um, another element on the next slide you'll see is our equity workforce, um, our energy workforce equity portal. And this is the portal I mentioned that we have really designed to share information with the sector at large. And so the, the portal will include employment opportunities um, for those EEPs. It will also connect clean energy companies with EEPs and vice versa. Um, it'll allow companies to post job opportunities. And it also um, provides training and resources for individuals who are looking to join the sector. Um, on the next slide. Oh, yes. Um, so this just reiterates what the portal currently contains and, and what we're hoping it will do is really trying to connect um, individuals with companies in the sector. Um, and on the next slide, um, we'll walk through just a couple of state policies that are designed to advance equity in the sector. And so the first is prevailing wage requirements. And so these ensure that all of the jobs in the clean energy economy are well-paying jobs. And the IPA Act requires that um, any new utility scale uh, solar, wind, or brownfield sites, as well as any new solar projects um, that participate in our Illinois Shines program, with a couple of exceptions, are, um, are following and complying with this prevailing wage act. Um, and on the next slide, there is um, we have the project labor agreements. And so these are another layer of protection um, that's been added to ensure that these are good jobs with good work environments. And so any new utility scale projects um, must be built by general contractors who've been enter who enter into a project labor agreement. And these labor agreements um, are, are sort of pre-hire collective bargaining agreements that really cover all of the terms and conditions of employment on these construction projects. And so the IPA has conducted power hours on all of these topics that go further into the details of the legislation and its impact on our work. And these recordings are available on our website if you'd like um, to dive a little deeper and get a better understanding of this. And with that, I will pass it back to Brian. Thanks so much, Tati. Up next, we have Hillary of DCEO. Wow, I love it when colleagues and presenters just really set each other up. Uh, you saw in the first um, presentation, you saw where the demand is and where the inequity lies. Then you see with IPA potential solutions and solutions to that equity on a state level. And so I hope to expand your access and your um, exposure to the state level opportunities to address equity and give you a visual of what we really mean when we say equity. So next slide, I just want to um, let you know who I am. So Hillary from uh, DCEO, the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity for the great state of Illinois. And my major responsibility today is just to share with you the workforce and contracting ecosystem opportunities that exist within the Climate Equitable Jobs Act, better known as CJA. Next slide. And so that's the roadmap, but you can keep going. And so just in case you're not familiar with CJA and what it really means and what it intends to do, this is a, a quick picture just to state that CJA's goal is to put Illinois on track to be 100% renewable energy by 2050. And in an effort to do that, there are many 
elements of the pie that need to be accomplished. Workforce and contractor development is one of those elements of the pie in an effort for us to reach renewable energy by 2050. Those other elements include the transition to um, it, complete renewable energy includes the, the divesting of current fossil fuel plants. And so therefore we need to support our fossil fuel workers. It includes electric transportation, um, identifying carbon-free power and implementing those solutions. It includes creating, getting our buildings to become more energy efficient throughout the state. And so in the next slide, um, you hear the word equity a lot. And so what does that really mean? Well, the first presenter provided some statistics and gave you national data that demonstrates that there is what's called inequity. Well, equity is providing the building blocks. As you see in that second picture, everyone wants to have access to see the soccer game. Well, in this case, everyone wants access to economic opportunity, to great paying jobs that allow them to build generational wealth. Well, for some, they may need two blocks in an effort to see over the fence to gain access to that opportunity. And so CJA and many of the programs that you saw within IPA, those procurement um, requirements, those minimum equity um, standards, the prevailing wage, the IPA Act, those are the building, those are the boxes that certain individuals, certain Illinoisans need to stand on in an effort to access the opportunity. Eventually, hopefully, there will be justice where there is no fence, there is no barrier that prevents people from accessing things, and we don't have to implement blocks it blocks to gain to give them access or to gain legislate. We don't have to create legislation to gain access, but at this point. There are uh, enough systematic um, barriers that require us to create an equal footing for people to gain access to opportunities. And so that's what we're doing on a federal and a state level. Next slide. So when we say in CJA that we're focused on equity, what does that mean? That means we are eliminating and reducing barriers we are putting community in the driver's seat. And so we're wanting them to, we're wanting community to really collaborate with one another and leverage the internal resources and seek collectively external resources to develop a plan that really allows that community, that local community to gain the access and to create the economic and environmental justice that they deserve. We want um, within CJA for there to be resilience and for people to feel empowered so to have the tools at their fingertips to create the type of environment they desire to live in. Within CJA, we are setting goals and measures and outcomes. And based off of that data, we will adjust. And then, you know, finally creating a future of creating a, an, an Illinois of, of collective action, of belonging. Next slide. So when we look at the CJA ecosystem, as I like to call it, there are workforce and contractor programs. So under the contractor programs within CJA that exist within, with that are housed under the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, DCEO, we have the contractor incubator and the prime accelerator. Those uh, programs respectively are annually, have an annual financial allocation of 21 million and 9 million per year. The workforce training programs include the climate, um, the, the climate works pre-apprenticeship program, the workforce hubs as we call them, and the returning residents. And so the workforce hubs and the pre-apprenticeship programs all have what's called navigator and, or, and barrier reduction programs to support the recruitment assessment and, and equitable needs that participants who are in those programs may need access to. And so these programs are all um, governed by commissions, councils, and boards. In addition to the workforce, and the contractor programs, there are um, economic development programs. So if you click 
one more time, you'll see the economic development programs that DCEO will, will administer. And that includes the coal to solar. That includes when there are seven energy um, plants that will be converted from coal to solar storage. And that will, those plants will hopefully contract with the contractors that we are incubating and accelerating. And those contractors will hire the workforce that we are training and, and supporting. Also under the economic development programs within DCO is the Energy Transition Community Grant, the Equitable Energy Future Grant, and the Solar Sovereignty Grant. So the Energy Transition Community Grants are for those communities who have experienced plant closures, who have experienced um, you know, closures of major employers within the energy industry in their community. So there's funding specifically every year to help address the, the revenue loss, the, the labor loss in those communities and to chart a future um, of, of growth and sustainability, perhaps in the clean energy sector. And then under the Equitable Energy Future Grant, we really focus on programs that have energy efficiency or renewable project um, deployment. So if you have a project that has an energy efficiency or renewable technology implementation we, we that's located in an environmental justice community, you know, there is funding for the pre-development expenses associated with that project. And then the Solar Sovereignty Grant is for communities who desire to uh, own their own energy and 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 to make sure that energy impacts in a positive way and benefits the residents in that community. So on the next slide, I, I show you what that looks like for the state of Illinois, where these programs will sit. So the regional workforce hub and contractor. Um, programs. There will be 13 of those programs scattered throughout the state of Illinois, located in what we call environmental justice and R3 communities. The Climate Works pro pre-apprenticeship programs and the Prime Accelerator hubs, there will be three of those throughout the state of Illinois, one located in the central, the northern, and the southern regions of the state. Next slide. So I briefly went through on a couple of slides ahead what the incubator program, um, what some of these programs did. Um, I just wanted to bring to your attention the incubator program um, and, and highlight the fact that one of its major focuses is to support contractors in gaining access to capital and um, and really training and mentoring them to really support them in either startup development of a clean energy business or providing um, the additional resources to get them more grounded in an effort to chart a path to growth. Next slide. And then I mentioned a little bit about the energy equity, the energy future grant. You know, here wanted to raise wanted you to see some of the project activities and that you can use the funding for. So it really is geared towards pre-development. So there's those architectural engineering designs, the site assessment, the feasibility of the project. Oftentimes these things that have to be done at the very beginning of a project can be cost prohibitive, but we don't want our R3 communities, environmental justice communities, not having access to these wonderful economic opportunities because they don't have the building blocks. They don't have that block to stand on in the first place to see the economic opportunity. This grant is providing that building block towards equity. Next slide. And so when we talk about the, the training programs, the question is often, well, what is included in these workforce hub training programs or the, the pre-apprenticeship programs? And so what's included is, is this. At the very beginning, we are recruiting and we are assessing the potential um, participants. And so the navigator uh, grantee 
it, or the workforce hub or pre-apprenticeship hub is responsible for recruitment. And then they're also responsible for assessing that particular individual to, to make sure that a clean energy job is the future that they desire. Then there's the job readiness training, and then there's the technical training. And if you click one more time, you will see some of the specific training programs that CJA is, is suggesting and promoting. So solar installation, um, construction uh, training related to weatherization and energy efficiency and energy auditing, um, electrical and HVAC training with the focus of upskilling or skilling towards the clean energy, the green economy. So, and then on the next click, you will really see what we expect as it relates to positions to be offered. So the idea is that the, each hub will decide which of these specific training curriculum programs it will administer and really evaluate what the opportunity is in their local community. And once that opportunity is identified, you reach out to the potential businesses, you work with your local governments to create the infrastructure to attract business so that it can support and put to work the people that you are training. That is the overall thought process of CJA. That's the spirit of CJA. That's the way the programs are developed in that CJA puts funding, almost $180 million every year of funding towards workforce development, contractor development, and economic development, that ecosystem, so that there are projects being developed that creates the demand for the contractors and the workforce that we're training. Next slide. Um, oftentimes people wanna understand what does the ecosystem structure look like for a workforce hub? And so I just put this slide here for you to see that it could, um, it, it really does encourage collaboration. On the right-hand side, you have these different colors, the main grantee, the community-based organization, the training provider, and the navigator and barrier reduction program provider. So a grantee could choose to be one of all of these, or they could truly choose to have multiple partners within their community who are really good at doing those things already and really collaborate and use economies to scale, to build capacity and, and inclusion to, in an effort to execute the, the Illinois Green Economy CJA ecosystem. Next slide. And so, of course, the question is, OK, Hillary, when is the money coming out? When will we have access to the, these funding opportunities? So in May, we released the pre-apprenticeship programs um, and those individuals, those grantees have been informed. The Navigator program, um, NOFO, was released in June. That's currently under merit review. And depending on um, the, the results of that merit review, those awardees will be dispersed. If there are areas that don't have adequate, that don't have adequate support for those communities, then we will reissue, you know, and um, it's rolling right now. So that means we will allow people to then apply for those specific demographic areas that don't have adequate coverage. In July, um, we released the Workforce Hub programs, similar situation. That um, program is under merit review. And then again, if there are parts of the state that don't have coverage, then we will encourage people to, to apply for those particular areas. And then coming this fall and winter, we hope to release the incubator program, the returning residents program, as well as the Energy Future, Solar Sovereignty, and Prime Accelerator. So we really hope to get the rest of these programs out um, within uh, the latter half of 2023. And next slide, I believe. Um, I just wanted to draw to your attention that CJA includes working with multiple state agencies, IPA, one of them, um, the EPA and Commerce Commission, 
at, at DCO, the others. And so if there are any questions, um, I look forward to the questions that will follow after the next presenter. I think that's the last of my slides. Next slide. Thank you, Hillary. Looks like um, we may have had one more here. Yeah, eco the state ecosystem as it relates to CJA, you know, energy efficiency and renewable. There are, um, as we've heard, there is an enormous amount of money on the state and federal level. The governor has given a push to agencies to really pursue the federal funding. So multiple state agencies are working collectively to pursue energy efficiency and renewable energy funding to support the state's goal of reaching renewable energy um, by 20. 50. Great. Thanks again, Hillary. Um, we also have um, Hillary's contact info, which we will share again at the end here. But in the meantime, let's uh, introduce our last speaker, Hugo Avila. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for, for that, Brandon, uh, Brian. Uh, next slide. I want to start off by talking a little bit about our organization, Central States Air. Uh, we are a non-for-profit uh, workforce development organization. Uh, since 1987, SARE has assisted over thousands of uh, marginalized and disadvantaged residents across the city of Chicago and suburban Cook County in achieving their career and academic goals through uh, quality employment, education, and training programs. SARE is deeply integrated in the communities that we serve and believe in being part of the solution and ongoing challenges of economic and educational disparities facing families today. Uh, Sarah's mission is to promote economic self-sufficiency, upward mobility for low-income community residents through education and employment. Uh, next slide. Uh, we, we specifically focus on two main type of programming for adult and youth. Under our adult programming, uh, we, we focus on employment assistance and occupational job training for Cook County residents uh, in the demand industries. Uh, we provide support such as labor market consult, uh, counseling, career coaching, interview skills, training, resume development, and navigating job search process. Uh, through job search referrals, placement services, job club activities, and hiring events, uh, we're able to provide uh, opportunities for individuals looking for employment. Additionally, we, uh, we also provide paid occupational training in high demand industries. Uh, we are a WIOA provider, so we receive funding from the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. Uh, the Chicago Workforce Partnership is our primary funder in this area. Uh, and, and as of course, the WIOA program is a federal program that's administered here locally at the state from the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. On our youth programming, we assist young people between the ages of 16 and 24 who are at risk of non-traditional success into adulthood, both in education or emotionally. Uh, we tend to focus on youth from low-income and underserved communities, including those who have previously been involved with gangs or just or who are justice involved. Our programs help uh, youth identify and pursue, achieve their academic goals, job and career goals by providing intensive career coaching and case management services, GED classes, job readiness training, work-based learning opportunities, supportive services such as transportation, restorative justice, and uh, service learning projects and leadership training. Uh, next slide. One, one of the main focuses that we have here at um, Central States there is we do have a construction pipeline program, which is a series of pro uh, programs intertwined uh, to help uh, that are designed to target individuals interested in pursuing careers in construction industry. These, these programs help build the skills and knowledge necessary to succeed in the union trades by assisting individuals navigate the application process and providing financial support to cover costs of applications, fees, tools, transportation, and union dues. Specifically under this umbrella of construction pipelines, we offer a pre-apprenticeship program. Uh, this is an 11 week program where individuals 18 and older are informed and guided in regards to uh, opportunities for good paying jobs and entry level jobs or office jobs related to the construction industry. Individuals participate in a series of in-person class preparation and on-site job shadowing, which gives candidates an up-close look at varieties of career paths. Next slide. Additionally, SARE provides uh, const uh, construction bridge programming. This is 10-week programming for individuals, young adults between 16 and 24, 
uh, to allow them to obtain the skills necessary for them to be able to enter the, the construction field. Uh, the main focus of this particular bridge programming is to provide job readiness preparation, educational support specifically in math, which we found to be the one of the um, major inequities with individuals looking to enter the construction trades, and also to provide them career exploration so they, uh, so young people can get a much better sense of the different opportunities that are available in the construction industry. And then we ourselves offer two vocational training programs, one focused on industrial me uh, mechanic training program, where individuals learn to maintain, troubleshoot, and repair machinery and equipment used in the warehouse and manufacturing companies, and the other in solar panel training program. Uh, next slide. So specifically, I'd like to talk about the solar uh, photovoltaic installer program that we offer that's funded by the Illinois Department of Commerce and, and Economic Opportunity. Next slide. So our uh, NAPSEP uh, program is in partnership with St. Augustine College Institute of Workforce Development. This 13-week uh, photovoltaic installer program uh, offers individuals an opportunity looking to enter the renewable clean energy industry. The program provides comprehensive job readiness preparation, including soft and hard skills training to ensure students are equipped with the necessary skills to succeed in a professional setting. The program offers in-class instruction and in essential electronic systems, troubleshooting, maintenance, and installation of photovoltaic systems. Hands-on lab work is integrated component of the program to provide students with practical experience to prepare them for the field. Upon completion of the program, students are provided with career placement services, leveraging a network of established employment partners. Additionally, economic training programs such as the on-the-job training program are available to graduates to bridge the fundamental knowledge with real-world implementation. Next slide. The program itself consists of uh, focuses on shop math and basic electricity. Uh, as I mentioned, in the previous slide, one of the biggest difficulties we found with individuals looking to enter uh, these type of fields in, uh, in construction and photo installation is that we found that there was a lack of math skills and math levels needed in, the, in, the, in order for these young people and, and participants to be able to grasp the material in order to be able to provide uh, the, the actual fundamental uh, implementation of, of, of the skills that they were going to learn. And so there's a, there's a strong focus in mathematical building um, and reading schematic diagrams and understanding fundamentals of, of how electricity works, how these circuits relate to each other, and how to be able to understand how <clears throat> changes in voltage can affect the power that's being uh, sent into the system. Next slide. Additionally, there's uh, direct hands-on uh, focus on the installation, uh, understanding the uh, and identifying uh, photovoltaic and regards to advantages and disadvantages of placement and in this implementation, understanding the different systems and components and, and, and their functions, how to install these uh, so, uh, photovoltaic systems and assess system operation efficiency. And of course, uh, training focuses on maintenance, troubleshooting, and identifying appropriate uh, uh, implementation of these kind of systems. Next slide. I'd like to kind of dive in a little bit into regards to the need for solar. Some of these, uh, next slide. Some of these kind of top uh, bullets have already kind of been expressed, but just to reiterate, uh, the Future Jobs Act, FIJA, and the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act require that the state generate 25% of its energy and renewable by 2025. Uh, the state itself has invested more than $2 billion in solar energy and is looking to achieve 100% sustainability. Uh, the solar energy industry expects the sol uh, expects solar industry to increase by more than 1,700% in the next five years. Salaries in, in Illinois range anywhere from 66000 to 99000 depending on the work market in Illinois, and this includes uh, experience and additional skills. Employment of installers is expected to grow by 22% between uh, this this uh, last year and this year, and about 3,500 openings or solar panel installers this year alone. In the last 10 years, solar prices have fallen by 53%, while solar installation has increased by more than 2,000%. Next slide. At the local level, uh, we here at SARE have observed that many individuals who are interested in the solar training programs that we offer are tend to be in their mid-40s. 
and are primarily from our general service area of North and South Lawndale communities of Chicago. Uh, these communities are concentrated in the environmental justice communities. Uh, the majority of these individuals have previous work experience in the construction industry or manufacturing or come from entry level roles such as retail or food services. Most of the participants that we have been working with and participating in our programs have some college and have uh, had past involvement in the justice system or possess some sort of barrier to employment. 95% of the individuals that we service uh, within these vocational programs that we offer tend to be African-American or Hispanic with men being the majority, but we have seen an increase of interest from women in our programming. Uh, these individuals have expressed interest in training due to the expected growth in the industry and access to vocational training specifically being offered in their communities. Uh, Sarah has also noted exist, uh, existing construction roofers uh, as a main population who are interested in upskilling their skills in this particular trade uh, to make themselves more marketable in the job market. More, uh, moreover, many participants have expressed interest in becoming entrepreneurs and view solar as an, an industry with low barriers to entry. Uh, one specific success story I'd like to highlight is um, in our uh, FIJA contract, uh, has, has <clears throat> we have an individual by the name of Jesus Lugo who completed their solar uh, training program back in October 26th. Uh, he was an excellent student, attended job readiness preparations that we offer, classes and hiring events that, that we provided, uh, received various uh, supportive services such as transportation. Uh, with all our particular programs, we tend to offer one-on-one -on -one case management, uh, in addition to labor market with guidance and industry trends, job leads and direct referrals to employment. And he was able to obtain employment as a project manager at National Solar, earning now 83,000 a year from his previous uh, entry level uh, experience that he previously held. Next slide. Of course, my, my contact information is there and I do know it's also shared at the end. And then um, that concludes my presentation which I believe will lead us into the question and answer segment. Yes, it will. Thanks very much, Hugo. Um, just uh, one question so far through the chat, um, which I believe came in during Hillary's portion. Um, we have Gregory Bush who asks, um, please describe the quote, culture of belonging and how it is fostered. Sure. So great question. Um, a culture of belonging would suggest that um, much like the the picture that you saw, the equity picture that you saw, that there is an opportunity that exists within the state of Illinois and um, all Illinoisans can have access to it. And so it is the responsibility of, of our leaders um, and then thus those within state agencies to create um, an environment which all Illinoisans can can access the opportunity. So that's I, what I what I would suggest. Um, the spirit of the siege of legislation meant when they said, you know, belonging. Thank you. Also included in the chat are some resources sub submitted by Joe Duffy. Um, I'd like to share this information about contact info for our presenters in case anybody has additional questions they'd like to reach out about. On behalf of the IPA, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this webinar. We hope it was educational. Also, I want to extend a thank you to each of today's presenters for providing an excellent presentation on an important topic. Um, thanks, and we'll see you at the next Power Hour on October 27th. Have a great weekend. Thank you, everyone.